So, you might have heard about the new CRISPR-Cas9 drug called Casgevy that alters the genes of patients with sickle cell. It was huge news in the scientific community in 2023, and in this video, I just want to walk through the background and the mechanism of this groundbreaking drug, because it's not really something I've heard a lot of people talk about. There's a lot of talk about the ethics of it all, but not as much about the actual mechanism of what's going on in the body. I really believe that understanding the drug is a crucial first step to being able to talk about this CRISPR drug and all of the other implications that go along with a CRISPR drug. So let's get into it. Casgevy, the drug that put genetic editing into the commercial pharmaceutical world. So first off, we need to talk about sickle cell anemia, the disease that this drug treats. If you've taken a biology class in the past 20 years, you've probably heard about this before. It's pretty much the poster child for teaching people about genetic diseases. So this will be more of a high level overview. Essentially, sickle cell anemia is a disease which affects your red blood cells and occurs when you inherit two copies of the defective HBB gene, meaning one copy from each parent's. Two copies of the HBB defect is generally the most severe form of sickle cell disease, but there are less severe forms where you only inherit one copy, and this is called sickle cell trait. The specific defect in sickle cell anemia is caused by a single letter change in the DNA code, a simple change from T to A in the HBB gene, which causes the downstream protein which that DNA codes for to change. DNA codes for proteins, and when you change the letter of a DNA, even just one, you get a change in protein. In this case, you have a single nucleotide polymorphism because only one nucleotide has morphed in the DNA. The result is a change in one amino acid, the building block of protein. Where we once had glutamic acid, we now have valine, and this ends up affecting the whole structure of the HBB protein. This protein, coded by the HBB gene, is called beta hemoglobin or beta globin. Beta-globin is the building block of hemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying protein in red blood cells. Hemoglobin is crucial for transporting oxygen around the body and transporting it into all of our tissues. Now, hemoglobin is composed of four parts, two alpha-globins and two beta-globins. This will become important later. And when you get the defective copy of the beta-globin, the hemoglobin as a full molecule will sort of crumple in on itself. And this results in the molecule forming a sickle shape, hence the name of the disease, which cannot really carry oxygen anymore. As you might have guessed, this is extremely dangerous because all cells need a constant supply of oxygen. The resulting lack of oxygen can lead to pain, fatigue, weakness, and a host of other issues, one of the worst being what's called a pain crisis, which is severe pain that can last from several hours to several days and can even lead to death. Okay, so that was a really quick rundown of sickle cell, but essentially a change in the DNA causes an incorrect protein to form, which causes the hemoglobin molecule to not work properly. This can be deadly and is truly a terrible disease. It also happens to be more common in people of African descent because malaria is common in Africa. Carrying one copy of the defect is thought to be protective against malaria, but that's a different story. I just think it's an interesting note I wanted to mention. But going back to the main point, the big thing about sickle cell is that it's a genetic disease. And for a genetic disease, it's relatively simple. A single change in one letter, an SMP, that causes a downstream issue. So shouldn't be too hard to fix, right? That brings us to CRISPR. CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regular Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, now you know why there's an acronym, is a type of RNA we actually discovered in bacteria. It's one of a two-part system called CRISPR-Cas9, where CRISPR is the RNA and Cas9 is an enzyme or protein associated with the CRISPR. Bacteria naturally produce this complex because when bacteria are infected with a virus, yes, bacteria can get viruses too, the bacteria stores copies of the viral DNA in their own DNA in repeating patterns. When the virus then attacks again, the bacteria will utilize that stored viral DNA and transcribe it into RNA called CRISPR. That CRISPR RNA is identical to the invading virus, so it will stick to it. Matching up eats C, G, A, and U until it makes one complex. Once matched up, the assisting enzyme called Cas9 that was attached to the CRISPR will cut the viral DNA, effectively inactivating it. Now, scientists observed this rather wild phenomenon and decided to harness it for themselves, as scientists do. 
except instead of viral DNA being the template, scientists can just make whatever they want be the template, literally any region in the DNA. They just give the CRISPR RNA a little guide sequence that matches up with their target region so that CRISPR know which parts of the DNA to attach to, and once it's attached to its designated target, the Cas9 enzyme will make a cut to the DNA and break it. Sometimes called the CRISPR-Cas9 system and sometimes just CRISPR, it's an incredibly powerful tool for genetic editing. But I want you to pay attention to something there. CRISPR-Cas9 cuts DNA, but it doesn't correct DNA. Now there's many other technologies out there that have the ability to correct and even insert DNA, but those are incredibly complex and actually not being used in the Cas-Jevy drug. In the CRISPR drug for sickle cell, they are simply cutting the gene. So hopefully you're asking yourself this question around now, how can a technology used to cut DNA correct DNA? The solution is rather ingenious and I honestly could never have guessed how this was done before doing more research. It's a graceful solution in the way that it uses just one cut to make a major correction to the whole system. Now, before I tell you how they do this, there's one final piece of background I need to explain, so stick with me. When we are developing in the womb, we are competing with our mothers for oxygen. From the point of view of oxygen, there's absolutely no reason to cross the placenta and into the womb if we are perfectly happy on the hemoglobin that we jumped into while in our mom's lungs. So in order to receive oxygen, fetuses produce what's called fetal hemoglobin, a form of hemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen, essentially meaning it's more sticky to oxygen than normal adult hemoglobin is. The high affinity of fetal hemoglobin is attractive to oxygen and facilitates the jump of oxygen across the placenta, which allows the growing fetus to receive oxygen. But besides higher affinity, this fetal hemoglobin is basically the same as adult hemoglobin. The only difference is its composition. Instead of two alpha globins and two beta globins, like in the adult hemoglobin, it's composed of two alpha globins and two gamma globins. Now, if you remember to earlier in the video, sickle cell anemia only affects beta globin, not alpha globin, and definitely not gamma globin. So fetuses with sickle cell anemia actually don't have an issue with sickle cell symptoms. In fact, infants continue to express fetal hemoglobin up until about 6 to 12 months, so you won't even see sickle cell symptoms in babies until at least a little while after birth. So we have the gene for beta globin and we have the gene for gamma globin, and something at around 6 months of age tells the body to stop expressing the gamma subunit and start expressing the beta subunit. Well, there's actually a ton of factors that control this switch, but there is only one we're interested in today, and that is a region of the DNA called BCL11A. Sorry, there's no fun nickname. BCL11A is a transcription factor, or region of DNA that controls other regions of DNA, which turns off the production of gamma globin. When gamma globin is turned off, beta globin steps in to replace it in the hemoglobin molecule, and that makes adult hemoglobin. And remember, fetal hemoglobin is not dangerous to adults, it does the, pretty much the exact same thing. As far as we know, it has a higher affinity for oxygen and does not disrupt normal body function. Hopefully, as I'm explaining this, the parts are starting to click in place as how we can use a single clip to fix sickle cell. So let's put it all together. Scientists have a tool to make a cut in DNA, and there's a region of DNA that controls the switch from fetal to adult hemoglobin, with fetal hemoglobin not being affected by sickle cell anemia mutation. So we use the CRISPR to make a cut in BCL11A, the fetal hemoglobin off switch, which will allow fetal hemoglobin to continue to be expressed up into adulthood and then prevent adult hemoglobin from taking over. And through this, people who would have suffered from this lifelong disease can rely on their own body's production of fetal hemoglobin throughout adulthood and live relatively normal lives. Okay, a lot of science there, and in my opinion, genetics are some of the hardest aspects of technology, but if you are still with me, welcome to the future of science and medicine. There are still a lot of imperfections in the medicine itself that makes it less than perfect, and that is to be expected with a new drug. This is the first of its kind. First, you have to be 12 years or older to receive this drug, which can be too late for many people. Second, it's expensive. I was hearing 2.2 million last time I checked. And third, the process of getting this drug is not as simple as a pill or injection. 
While CRISPR is amazing and precise, it's not precise enough, and we want to be incredibly cautious when introducing such powerful technology into the body. So where it currently stands, CRISPR is not introduced into the body at all. Instead, stem cells from the patient's bone marrow are removed and altered in a lab before transplanting back into the patient. The process can be quite long and difficult, up to six months, and with a lot of hospital treatment to prepare for both the giving and receiving of those stem cells. But this elongated process allows scientists to ensure purity and correctness of the DNA that they are putting back into your body. As pure as it can be, at least. Remember, there are many factors that control development, and we only altered one, so in practice, some adult hemoglobin is still produced. Luckily, this procedure only has to occur once as it stands now. Uh, this could change as we do long-term studies, but theoretically, since we are altering stem cells, they can continue to produce fixed red blood cells indefinitely. So that was all the key points to know about the mechanism of this drug. This is the first ever drug approved for direct CRISPR therapy, and while many therapeutics utilize CRISPR during the production process, this is really the first of its kind to put it directly in use in patient cells. And all things considered, I think it's pretty amazing. Patients report monumental improvement of conditions after the procedure, and I imagine we will only improve the technology in the future. If you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I know I didn't really get into the ethics of it, and honestly, that is not my area of expertise. But now that you are more aware of the mechanism and how it actually looks on the patient's side of things, I would love to hear your comments about the use of CRISPR to cure diseases. I know it could be a slippery slope and people stand on all ends of the spectrum when it comes to the ethics of it, so let's just be respectful about other people's opinions. This is the future of technology. There's not really any precedent, but I think discussions are super welcome in this topic. Anyway, I hope you learned something about this fascinating and historically important drug. Thank you for watching.